I just wanted to say that in, in 1991, um, I, I remember attending the performance. Did, we, did you go to it in 1991? No, no, no. No, I was a, um, a young mum. <laughs> who had no tertiary qualifications or interest in anything other than surviving that. Yes, well, look, uh, I, was, I was surviving uh, probably <coughs> by treatment at the university as a result of activism after the earthquake. Um, but, uh, but in fact, it wasn't well attended. It was, it was people, Newcastle people didn't go. It was perhaps too raw. Mm. And, um, yeah, and I think probably the same thing happened with the Black Rock around um, the Lee Ling murder. Is that the murder that you talked about? It is, yes. yes. That's the other yes. deaths that I've researched that probably have been in Black Rock and so forth. Right. And the contentious nature of all of that. Yes, yep. Um, so I'm just still going strong as well and being performed as we speak. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking too that probably another docudrama will one day be written about the murder of Frank Newbury. Mm. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, so I just wanted to make that comment that, that uh, you know, it, it wasn't, um, it was still raw in yes. 1991. Yes. Yeah, and understandably so. Yeah. And still raw for a number of people at the time the film came out. Yes. There were people, of course, who didn't want to have any part in any of this, mm. in the original, you know, approach. Obviously, that was their personal choice, whether or not they wanted to speak to people about it. Um, and that was definitely the case as well during my research when I approached people for interviews. Um, that happens in research. And can I just ask another question? Mm. Did you draw heavily on the tremendous work that had been done by Ajita Lewis? No. Well, there's an amazing collection. Ajita Lewis, sadly, um, has died, but she, she was given funding to document, um, you know, put together a, a, an enormous um, visual and oral uh, record of the earthquake. No, I'm not which is, familiar which with is, that. You know, which is held, held at the library. There are CDs. Yeah. Yes. See, so, so my... My background, um, my research intent was more to do with the the idea of collaborative cultural production. <coughs> that I'm, that's definitely right. something I'd love to look at when I have time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. To me, the, the concept of documentary film is my research history. Um, do you? I can't remember how it works. One of the th there's been a phenomenal shift. around the concept of witnessing as part of the healing process from trauma and that concept of, of witnessing being a necessary part of trauma healing is something that's really quite new. Mm. Um, 40 years ago we couldn't talk about abuse. Mm. If somebody talked about being abused, they were not believed. Now the, the, the acknowledgement that that story needs to be told in a way that's appropriate for the mm. person mm. and to not in a voyeuristic way. We obviously don't think that right because there's a lot of but there, there's an acknowledgement in, um, in, in um, sort of healing ways that the, the stories have to be told and can be missed in a way that's appropriate for the person telling the story. Um, is, and one of the things that's striking me about that is that this, this was happening at a time when that wasn't particularly recognised. Yes, so, so it was it's very groundbreaking. And groundbreaking, which is, you know, what the Workers' Cultural Action Committee tried to do ordinarily on a, on a much smaller scale, but um, it is recognised and it has been recognised in that it's received um, playwright awards and so forth. But I hear what you're saying about within drama circles, and, then, uh, and I can't remember what the terminology is for it, but I remember meeting some people at a conference in Sydney last week and they talked about that idea of working through trauma. But I mean, people like um, Alana Val Valentine, has written quite a bit of Parramatta Girls. Um, we had um, Grounded, Hash of Olga, yeah. Stories from the yeah. Storm is another one. Um, there's some work going on to do with representation um, out of the, the Queensland floods. Um, there's actually, uh, there was one day 
conference in WA last week to do with creativity and crises. So it's definitely a right area. It's, it's been around a, a, a source of, you know, from the 60s, we've seen the way feminism was a big part in telling the stories there. But in, in terms of it being a uh, broad cultural trauma, yes. Well, the idea of localism in the in the world of globalism is becoming more prevalent, funnily enough, which is good for us. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask you, um, Judith, about verbatim theatre pieces as a response. Just bouncing off Debbie's question as a response to the earthquake, I, I'm aware of um, an academic at Canterbury University in Christchurch who's producing this international. Mm -hmm. um, Collect collection on um, earthquakes around the world, and so film is an incredibly common response. And I'm interested in the idea that you mentioned of the documentary theatre performances uh, along socialist principles in in Britain. And um, just anything more you have to say about that? Oh uh, well, I don't know a lot about it. Mm. <laughs> you know when you have to do a literature review. Yes. Yes. Well, um, Derek Padgett is a well-known. Uh, published person yeah. who's, who's written quite extensively about the development of uh, verbatim and doc or documentary theatre performance mm -hmm. from, a, from a British context. Uh, I know people such as um, Jimmy McGovern, some of you may be familiar with his work, who's involved with writing uh, Redfern Now, which is currently screening on the ABC. Uh, he's also written uh, and Cracker and other things, but he's also worked with a number of people years ago on the on the docks, and I'm being quite general here because I can't remember the specifics, to develop a series um, around issues to do with, you know, industrial disputes and so forth. So it's more a form of, the, the verbatim theatre is more a form of storytelling rather than, as you said, um, it, it's not so much he therapy or catharsis in response to a tragedy no. or a crisis? Or no, I don't think it is. And okay. I think that the people who are involved with developing it at the start hmm. had that intention in mind. So right. in that regard, it's a slightly different hmm. concept to what you're referring to. But it's mostly uh, cultural intermediaries like theatre critics and so forth hmm. that attach those <coughs> kinds of meanings to what this is meant to achieve. Because I guess, if they're not involved with it um, at an intimate level, then it's difficult for them to make the connection about the wider value of this thing. You know, how could it? And the <coughs> shops wasn't received favourably by all critics initially either. There were others mm -hmm. who, again, thought it was too parochial, too Newcastle. Ooh, ooh, who cares? <laughs> you know, and there were others who went, "Oh my goodness, isn't this amazing?" So you know, you're always going to get that. It sells papers anyway. Mm -hmm. Tim. By telling the stories, I you say truth, the, the truth and accuracy of storytelling, it can then have a whole lot of things. Um, I think the, the, the witnessing aspect is one of the things that's one thing that can kind of shoot from that. Having another perspective that gets um, put into a historical record is another mm -hmm. important thing. But the, the intent doesn't have to be any one intent, but the, um, the ramifications of telling the story with integrity goes off in, in a whole lot of different directions. Yes, and the process is involved in the collaborative development yeah. of that and ensuring, I mean, I'm sure there were issues and disputes and problems on like human nature throughout these processes, but the the idea was to have a democratic system in place to allow mm -hmm. that kind of production to come out of it. And just one final one from oh, oh, Margaret and then... Okay. Okay, perhaps Vera and then Margaret. Yeah, okay. So, Judith, I was interested about whether Newcastle has a right to exist. I experienced this in, when I went to Sydney. We went for a, a couple of months for a year because my husband was sacked from his work twice. And the Bureau of Labor said, Mr. Duggan, you won't get a job in Newcastle. So, we went to Sydney. Stayed 49 years, but kept very close contact, of course, with all my family. When I got to Sydney, I was appalled. All these Sydney people, in certain circles, were busy hating steel workers, waterside workers, and coal miners. And really affronted me. I was sort of at sea for a while, but it certainly stiffened my spine. 
Can I ask what year that was? 1948. Well, you know, when I went in 1985 to live in Bankstown, it wasn't any different. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, yeah, anyway, I did my best city. to change that because my parents brought us up to, to respect, even revere the miners. My dad said, thank God I've never had to go down in a mine. And I learned that when miners arranged me to go down, what it's like. And listening to the stories of miners during the war, when the leadership had to persuade the miners to produce the coal for the war effort when they were still suffering from the 1929 lockouts and the poverty and extreme hardship of the 30s and so on, uh, they were convincing that the main blow was to defeat the Nazis. But this man from Berwick Pit came in and said, oh, I had to talk to blokes to going down and it was a beautiful day, the sun was shining, the sky was blue, the ocean, you know, the whole thing. They didn't want to go down, they were arguing over pit props, which are very important to the underground miner. But because of the line of prosecuting the war effort to defeat the Nazis was important, but the man was quite emotional. There were tears in his eyes. He was the, uh, I've got off my point, but you get what I mean. I don't well, I feel apologetic for Newcastle. Constantly justify it. And I resent what happens in Sydney because they're very Sydney-centric. It's a bloody Jezebel of a city. They take, <laughs> they take, they want to take the most, and yet the labour of the ordinary people produce so much. And, well, I won't go on, but I think you get my point. I do. <laughs> and I can relate exactly to the things that you're saying, you know, and I have a good friend who, who works um, on the walls who was recently witness to, you know, a terrible tragedy where one of his co-workers was killed and, and these kinds of issues to do with OH&S and having a voice and all that sort of thing. Yeah, okay. yeah. And then a, a quick final one from Margaret. I just wanted to uh, take up your point about um, things not mattering about Newcastle. Look, it was, it was really only involving the metropolitan media that got Newcastle noticed. We, you know, without going into it, a couple of days after the earthquake, we called a meeting of people affected by the um, by the earthquake, and to our amazement, 200 people turned up, and we formed the Citizens Earthquake Action Group. But the local media acted as a cheer cheerleader. The local NBN they saw it as an opportunity for development. Yes. The local Herald, the same. And in the ABC, I won't name a person, but when I went up to the ABC office on the hill and uh, asked them if they'd just say what was happening, the person in question said, we've got a chimney about to fall down. And so I stood in the stairway of the ABC and rang ABC National in Sydney. And, uh, and I also rang Chris Henning, who was in charge of page one of the Sydney Morning Herald on Sunday morning, only because I knew his mother, and said to him, look, you know, buildings are coming down, and so he said very laconically, that sounds like a good story. And so we got front page uh, 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 headlines, and the, and, and, but it was only kind of the local media were saw it uh, as an opportunity. The local council, the state government, and the local media went along with it. And the same thing happened with Lee Lee. It was only when Adele Horan, well, I believe that Adele Horan's article in the in the uh, in the Sydney Morning Herald was probably influential in Nick Enright writing the play, and you could say it was only it, it was only um, that the metropolitan media that saved the stockade uh, convict stockade from being developed into a high-rise hotel. <laughs> so, unfortunately, you know, I, I'm fourth praise for the role that Newcastle Herald has taken. In the, in the recent campaign led by Joanne McCarthy about the um, you know, sexual abuse of children, but that is a, that is not typical of the local media. I applaud them, but in those three instances, it was only involving the metropolitan media, the ABC, the Sydney Morning Herald, and even um, Channel Seven and Nine, when I was sending up helicopters uh, to the convict stockade. It's the only we haven't been able to depend on the local media until recently. Well, 
I won't digress too much, but uh, some of my colleagues and RHD students are looking into issues to do with local content, particularly Ooh. one guide to do with the commercial radio networks and ideas of black people. I just wanted to put in a plug for the ABC though on education. The first, uh, the, the only reporter sort of went into the ABC uh, when he was allowed to, but it was still very dangerous, was my son Ding yes. And he was giving reports to the world from Newcastle. <laughs> And he was a fine, fine journalist. Yes. Okay. Well, well excellent. Thank you. Uh, well, clearly some very, very interesting discussion here. Thanks for writing paper, Judith. And yes, Margaret, I would welcome your, your paper still. I think it's a really important event for the book project that, that needs to be in there. So, um, could you join with me in thanking uh, Judith?